Hello and welcome everyone um, to the technology webinar. Um, my name is Cam Leung and I'm a principal at the International Ethics Standards Board for Accountants, IESBA for short. I'll be the moderator for today's webinar. I'm really pleased that so many professionals have joined us today from all around the world. Um, so good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to you. Let me start by introducing our two presenters, Mr. Richard Huskin and Mr. Greg Driscoll, who are both members of our ISBIS Technology Task Force and participated in developing the proposed technology-related revisions to the ISBA Code of Ethics. Rich joined the IESPA board in January 2020 and is a global independence leader for Ernest & Young Global Network. He is also a member of ENY's Global Risk Management Executive Committee, Global Practice Group, and Global Professional Practice Committee. Greg is the technical advisor to the deputy chair of the IESPA board. He is a partner in the Risk Management Independence Group at KPMG in the United States. Today, both Rich and Greg will present and walk us through the key proposed technology-related changes to the code. Welcome, and thank you both for joining us today. So a few house rules before the presentation starts. If you have any questions at any time during the session, please submit them by using the question box in your Zoom control panel. There will also be time allocated at the end of the session for a Q&A, and both Rich and Greg will answer as many questions as time allows at the end of the presentation. This webinar event is being recorded and will be posted on the IASPA website. This means that you'll be able to access it later and share it perhaps with your colleagues and network. Um, now, without further ado, can I please request that the, um, the slides be put up and shared? Just hold on one second. Thank you. If we could just move to the second slide, please. That's right. Um, so today's presentation will focus on the four main areas as outlined on the slide. Um, and Rich and Greg will both be uh, passing off to each other to present the various areas. Now, without further ado, I'm gonna pass off to Rich now, who will present first. Thanks, Rich. Thank you, Cam, and, and welcome to everybody. And thank you for joining us for the webinar today. I'm gonna to start off, if we can move to the next slide, with a little bit of background uh, on the project and what led to, uh, to us issuing in track today. Um, for some obviously, the profession um, uh, has, has been recognized, the need for understanding and, and addressing the transformative effects of technology. <laughs> and at the same time, uh, the board began to think about the ethics implications for the profession of the various uh, technologies, um, some of which are listed on the slide. Um, and there are a lot of questions gets raised with the advance of technology and the application of technology uh, for the profession and for others. Um, what was what was the impetus behind the project? What, what needed, the ISBA board have been focused on understanding um, the effects of technology, the effects of transformation, some technology specifically, um, and, and in general, under thinking about the ethical implications and, uh, and admit whether there was additional changes that needed to be made to the code. So that led to the project getting started in 2019 um, and, and the issues paper that, uh, the, or phase one report that um, was issued. And if you'd like to see those original work, it's on the IESPA website. If we could move to the next slide. <clears throat> that It was interesting in that that phase one report was issued before um, some very important projects were completed uh, by, the, by the board, which were subsequently completed before we issued the exposure draft. And in particular, we're going to reference role and mindset project today and the aspects of that that informed and actually we build upon, uh, as you'll hear uh, Greg talk about in a little bit, and the NAS project, which was a significant project for the board and many of the principles in NAS, actually all the principles in NAS uh, carry over and we built on that in the technology project. And I'll talk about that a little later, but those were heavy influencers on where how this project and, and, and the work of the task force went because many of the items in the phase one report were actually addressed by Roland Mindset and by NAS. <clears throat> On top of that, uh, you may recall that there were two global surveys that were done. Uh, 
uh, and and uh, one was a survey on complexity, and the second survey was on uh, the auditor independence related to technology. Um, there was very strong responses to those surveys, a lot of information uh, that informed the task force and also the technology working group um, in, in our efforts to determine what next steps were and, and what were some things that were important to stakeholders. On top of that, by the time we uh, released the exposure draft, there had been more than 50 stakeholder outreach sessions uh, involving a wide variety of stakeholders uh, around the world from all geographies, um, many of some of which were national standard setting organizations, the IESBA's national standard setting um, group was was part of that outreach, there were other leaders that were involved, there were uh, accountancy organizations, uh, uh, individual um, uh, uh, state, excuse me, individual uh, I, IFAC members uh, from organizations, the IFER working group, the IOSCO C1 committee, um, the IESBA CAG was very important, um, and then the form of firms, and, and very importantly, uh, the IFAC small and medium practitioner were just a few, working group, were just a few of the the bodies that we touch base with. If we could move to the next slide. During the course of this, uh, all of this outreach, um, a couple things were um, uh, assessed. And, and importantly, as the, as the IESPA moves forward, we have split the technology work streams into two. Uh, one is the technology task force that has led to the proposed exposure draft and its role is to ensure that the code remains relevant. Um, build, we, our mandate was to build on the overarching um, uh, strong uh, content of the code. Um, we we um, focused on following and we'll talk more about this, the code's principle based approach. Uh, uh, what I mean by that is that you'll notice that certain aspects of what the changes are actually are not even specific to, to technology. And certainly the changes that are related specific to are technology agnostic and i.e. Um, we <coughs> did not address it in the context of a particular technological development because there's always gonna be new technologies emerging in the future and the code needs to be a principles-based document that um, is usable as the, as the the challenges or the technology and innovation of the day changes. On the right side, the rest, the, 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 the technology working group uh, was set up, SEP task force. Its role is principally fact finding, thought leader development of non-authoritative materials. And if you go out onto the IESBA website, there is a number of, uh, of uh, papers and documents that uh, emanate from the, the working group's efforts. Um, they continue to keep the board informed of the um, <clears throat> emerging developments with regard to technology and certainly look for any needs for further uh, changes to ethics and independence rules. Um, with that, let me move then that, that ultimately the project, the task force efforts, if we could move to the next slide, uh, led to the exposure draft. Um, it's designed to enhance the code's robustness uh, and expands its relevance in the environment uh, as it's reshaped by rapid technological advancements. It also addresses the ethical mindset and behavior of professional accountants, and Greg will talk a little bit about that. Um, and it, it, it also tries to address for those professional accountants in public practice some considerations um, and some clarification building off of the NAS standards as to uh, services that are uh, provided. The comment deadline, if you have not focused on that, is June 20th, 2022. This was a, this was a 120 day comment period. Um, we certainly, as a task force at member, uh, look forward to the comments and the further input from uh, the global community, uh, including um, your input from today's session. 
So um, with that, if we could move to the next slide, there are really five key elements of the, uh, of the pronouncement, um, the components, and we're gonna cover each of these as we, as we move through the rest of the program. Um, it brings attention to issues around competence and confidentiality and leadership impar imperatives in the uh, digital age. Um, it, it addresses the, the uh, factors that add to the complexity of the environment um, and output uh, factors that are relevant in relying on technology and the output of technology and addresses a new concept called complex circumstances. Uh, Greg will expand on that. Uh, it, it gives factors to consider for both professional accountants in business and in practice when relying on or using the output of technology. It does strip auditor independence um, components and makes clear some things that um, were in the code already, but it gets much more specific and much more broader in explaining what is meant by, by certain uh, terms. And then in part 4B, as it relates to um, assurance, it expands the scope of the code to address non-financial information, uh, i.e. ESG disclosures, and creates a framework for uh, consideration of independence um, as it relates to uh, um, the non-financial reporting information under ISAE when using ISAE 3000. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Greg who is going to talk about the ethics uh, section of the uh, proposed uh, standard in, in the exposure draft. Greg? Perfect. Thanks, Rich, and, and good day to everyone. And, and my thanks as well for joining uh, today. As Rich said, I am going to cover the proposed revisions to the IESBA code put forth in the technology exposure draft that relate to the ethical requirements for professional accountants in business and professional accountants in public practice. And if we can advance uh, two slides, actually, I believe. There you go. And, be, and before we get to the proposals in the technology exposure draft, I'm going to talk briefly about the uh, certain enhancements to the IESBA code related to technology that are present in the role and mindset of professional accountant standard that, that Rich mentioned a little earlier and that uh, became effective as of December 31st. 2021. And when we look at those revisions, they're mainly light touch points of emphasis on technology in the guidance on the fundamental principles and the application of the conceptual framework that were incorporated through the role and mindset standard in advance of the broader revisions that were expected through the technology project. So there, there were three main areas in role and mindset that we want to want to mention here. The first is an added highlight of technology in application material and the professional competence and due care fundamental principles. So you see here, um, the, the highlighted item was the revision. So uh, professional competence requires a continuing awareness and an understanding of relevant technical, professional, business and technology related developments, just to plant the seed as an area or a field of play of awareness and understanding, um, setting that expectation that uh, technology needs to be in the forefront of the minds of the professional accountant. The second revision in role and mindset related to technology is a revision to the objectivity fundamental principle that references technology. And you can see it here, exercise of professional or business judgment can be compromised by undue influence of or undue reliance on individuals, organization, technology, or other factors, because as technology becomes more and more in play, as professional accountants execute their professional activities, the opportunity for undue reliance on technology and bias impacting objectivity was something we wanted to bring to the fore in the role and mindset project. And then lastly, in a new section on the impact of bias when applying the conceptual framework, the notion of automation bias is included among a number of other examples of potential biases to be aware of when applying the conceptual framework. So you see, and there's a list of, I think, eight to 10, different types of biases, one of which is automation, automation bias, which you see defined here on the slide. So, so these revisions from the Roland Mindset Project, uh, essentially setting the stage, if you will, for the broader and more detailed revisions that we're going to be proposed and that have been proposed now through the technology project. 
So with that as a backdrop for Merlin Mindset, let's get into the proposals in the technology exposure draft and we'll move ahead to the next slide. And the first of those proposals is, uh, is on the professional skills needed to serve clients and employing organizations with professional competence as described in section 113 on the professional competence in due care fundamental principle. And as you can see here on the slide, the proposed revision is to add the application of interpersonal communication and organizational skills to the exercise of sound judgment in order to serve with professional competence. And the idea of this revision is to emphasize the types of professional skills or soft skills, if you will, needed by professional accountants in the digital age as technology continues to perform more and more tasks on behalf of the professional accountant and the professional accountant is left to interpret and apply the results of those tasks performed by technology. The revision builds on the role and mindset technology enhancements that I mentioned before and it's also based on specific learning outcomes of the international education standards which were recently revised themselves to reflect the specific skills needed by professional accountants in the digital age. So I encourage you to go ahead and check out those international education standards. The next revision that we're gonna talk about also refers, uh, also relates to the professional competence and due care fundamental principle, if we move ahead to the next slide. And it relates to the provision of information to clients, employing organization or other users of the P uh, professional accountant services when there are limitations inherent in the, uh, in the professional accountant services or activities. And the proposed revision to the requirement in R113.3 would require the professional accountant to provide users of their services or activities with sufficient information to understand the implication of any limitations inherent in those services or activities. The idea behind this revision is that trust in the professional accountant arises from transparency with stakeholders. And as a technology task force studied various artificial intelligence ethical frameworks that were put forth by many organizations, transparency was an element that was consistently included in those ethical frameworks. So this revision is intended to incorporate that notion of transparency into the professional competence in due care fundamental principle. If we move to the next slide, the next proposed revisions relate to the confidentiality fundamental principle. And the first is the incorporation of a definition of confidential information in the code's glossary. While confidential inform information is referenced in the confidentiality fundamental principle in, in the current in the extant version of the code, it's never defined in, in the extant code. So you can see here from the definition, any information, data, or other material in whatever form or medium including written, electronic, visual, or oral that is not in the public domain. And you can see that definition is fairly broad, and that's in recognition of the increase in data across all forms of media and the ease of access to such data. So the intention was to make that definition of confidential information as broad as possible to make sure it is all inclusive of all forms and sources of information that may be confidential. The other re revision related to confidentiality is new application material emphasizing the importance of maintaining confidentiality throughout all phases of the data governance lifecycle. And you can see the revision here in 114.1A1, maintaining the confidentiality of information acquired in the course of professional and business relationships involves the professional accountant taking appropriate action to secure such information in the course of its collection, use, transfer, storage, dissemination, and lawful destruction. And the other area that I will point out is the notion of securing such information, taking it a step beyond not disclosing and putting some emphasis on actions that the professional accountant should take to secure the information while it is in the, uh, the possession of the professional accountant. Okay, let's move to the next slide and start to move beyond the fundamental principles. And, and Rich had mentioned the notion of complex circumstances and the technology exposure draft does propose a new section to the considerations on applying the conceptual framework related to complex circumstances. And uh, in the early days of phase one of the technology project, the working group really stopped to consider what made the use of technology challenging for professional accountants, particularly the use of technology involving artificial intelligence, 
or other machine learning. And as we reflected on that and gathered uh, feedback through the complexity survey, we, we found it was the challenge to understand and explain how such technology worked because of its complexity. Now, as we started to deal with complexity, the, the working group and then the task force recognized that the idea of complexity was not limited to technology. And it's been around you know, for as long as professional accounts have been uh, performing professional activities. So what, what the task force endeavored to do was to find the optimum way to incorporate that notion of complexity into the code and how it impacts compliance with the fundamental principles in the application of the conceptual framework. And using feedback from the complexity survey that again, Rich mentioned earlier, um, the, the proposal is to add this new section on complex circumstances in the exposure draft. And when you look at the guidance and we'll unpack it over the next, couple, uh, the next two slides, um, the guidance is incorporated over three application material paragraphs. The first essentially highlighting the existence of complex circumstances. The second, essentially describing when those complex circumstances are present. And the third provides guidance on how those complex circumstances can be managed. So here on this slide is that first paragraph um, indicating the existence or potential existence of, of complex circumstances. And again, I, I won't read every word here, but you can see that this paragraph essentially points out that professional activities might involve complex circumstances um, that increase that increase the challenges of applying the conceptual framework um, and compliance to the fundamental principles. If we move to the next slide, you'll see the, the next paragraph is a description of when complex circumstances arise. And that is when the relevant facts and circumstances of the situation involve elements that are uncertain and multiple variables and assumptions which are interconnected or interdependent and those facts and circumstances might also be rapidly changing. And we had a lot of discussion as to when circumstances are, are complex or when circumstances are solely complicated or difficult and making a distinction between those two situations. And it was really the, the element of uncertainty and the presence of those multiple variables, variables and assumptions that impact the situation that take a set of circumstances from being difficult or complicated to the next level of, of being complex and, um, and, and needing some additional attention in their management. So that, that was how we got to the, the description of complex circumstances. And then lastly, the, the last paragraph here, 120.13A3, provides some guidance on how the professional accountant might manage the continued evolving interaction of those facts and circumstances as they develop to best mitigate the challenges arising from complex circumstances. And you can see a couple of the encouragements here in this paragraph, consulting with others, including experts, using technology to analyze relevant data to better inform the accountant's judgment, uh, making the firm or employing organization and other relevant stakeholders aware of the errant, inherent uncertainties or difficulties arising from the facts and circumstances, not unlike the requirement that we discussed back with professional competence and care, fundamental principle. And then lastly, monitoring any developments or changes in the facts and circumstances and assessing whether they impact any judgments that have already been made. So a, a set of uh, recommendations or encouragements to the professional accountants to optimally manage um, the continued evolving facts and circumstances, given the uncertainty of those facts and circumstances and the rapid, uh, the, the potential for rapid change in how those facts and circumstances are present. So a lot of discussion back to phase one and the working group, the original working group and the phase one report around complexity and through the task force and the development of the, of the exposure draft. So I encourage all of you to have a look at those paragraphs. Um, see if they are useful, see if they resonate with you regarding managing complex circumstances and providing feedback to the exposure draft um, as you respond. A couple of more proposals here that I'll cover on the, on the, ethical, uh, the ethical changes here on the next slide. The next revision relates to ethical leadership and builds on those revisions made in the role and mindset standard related to organizational culture. 
And, and you can see the additional guidance here to paragraph 120.14A3, prompting professional accountants to demonstrate ethical behavior in professional or business relationships as an example for others to follow. And this notion of ethical leadership, uh, I mentioned the, the artificial intelligence ethical frameworks that the working group and the task force um, studied in, in putting together the proposals in the exposure draft. And this idea of ethical leadership was certainly implicit, if not explicit, in, in all of those ethical frameworks. So uh, this is our foray into incorporating that notion of ethical leadership into the, into the code. Moving to the next slide, another element of the proposed revisions to the ethical requirements for both professional accountants in business and professional accountants in public practice are some specific considerations to assess the, public, the professional accountant in identifying threats to compliance with the fundamental principles when the professional accountant relies upon the output from technology. And you can see these considerations here on the slide. I'll point out a couple. Um, whether information about how the technology functions is available to the accountant, uh, whether the accountant has the professional competence to understand, use, and explain the output from the technology. And then last one I'll point out is whether the technology was designed or developed by the accountant or the employing organization and therefore might create a self-interest or, or a self-review threat. So as you have an ethical situation to which you're applying the conceptual framework and that situation involves reliance on the output of technology, uh, you would apply these considerations to assist in the identification of threats to compliance with the fundamental principles. And you can see here uh, by reference, this, this is a proposal to section 200.6 or paragraph, I should say, 200.6A2, which is in part two related to professional accountants in business. There is, as the little bubble at the top right-hand corner indicates, there is similar guidance in part three for professional accountants and public practice in paragraph 300.6A2. Okay, the last rounding out the proposals to the ethical requirements that we're gonna to cover today are factors to be considered again by both professional accountants in business, and you can go ahead and advance the slide, uh, by both professional accountants in business and professional accountants in public practice when relying on our using the output of technology. And these proposals are extensions of the respective extant sections relying on the work of others in section 220 for PAIBs, and using the work of an expert in section 320 for public accountants and, or excuse me, professional accountants and public practice. And the notion here is that in those cases, technology is essentially an artificial other or an artificial expert. Um, and there are factors, uh, analogous factors to consider when relying on the work of that artificial other or, or artificial expert. And uh, you can see the factors um, that are provided in the proposal to consider in determining whether reliance on the output of technology is reasonable. Um, and that's, that's the aim here is determine whether that reliance is reasonable. And you can see the list of factors here. Um, you know, a couple I'll point out, the professional accountant's ability to understand the output from the technology for the context in which it is to be used, uh, whether the technology is established and effective for the purpose intended, uh, the employing organization's oversight of the design, development, implementation, operation, maintenance, monitoring, or updating of the technology. So the controls in place at the organization, if you will, around the, the sufficiency and the effectiveness of the technology that is being relied on. So again, a number of factors to consider. No one factor, as is the case with most of these types of factors provided in the code, no one factor or group of factors is necessarily determinant as to whether or not reliance is reasonable and certain of the factors may or may not apply depending on the situation. So again, um, some factors to consider uh, when uh, a professional accountant is in a position of determining whether reliance on the output of technology is reasonable. And again, uh, this paragraph here on the slide is 220.782 from part two. The companion paragraph in part three is 320.10A2. So that covers the, the ethical revisions or the, the, revi the proposed revisions to the ethical standards. And I'll turn it back over to Rich to kick us off with a discussion of the proposed revisions to the international independent standards. Thank you, Greg. Can we move to the next slide? So we're gonna talk about the international independent standards, both those related to audits under 4A, and then we will finish up with a discussion of 
changes uh, I referenced earlier to 4B as it relates to uh, assurance services. Can we go to the next slide? As I indicated uh, early in the call, um, the, the original project was initiated prior to the NAS project being completed. And there are important elements that were determined by the board in the NAS project as it went was finally issued that impact on the um, uh, and, and in, inform the direction of the technology project and the exposure draft builds on those. Um, I'm going to mention a couple elements of the, pro the, the NAS project. Um, first, and for, first of all, the NAS called for uh, a change in, in how professional accountants interacted when providing a NAS service and required pre-concurrence from those charged with governance um, and required that the, the professional accountant inform those charged with governance, and provide certain information in order to uh, have those, those charged with governance pre-concurrence not object to the project. If we could move to the next slide, please. And, and those were, you know, as you can imagine, more complicated services would require more information to be provided about the nature and the scope, um, uh, whether what the threats are that have been identified, um, what safeguards might be applied, the basis for the conclusions and actions that might be taken, and importantly, whether the combined effect of providing multiple NAS services creates threats or changes the level of previously identified threats. So those, those principles all were built into the NAS project itself. Importantly, if we go to the next slide, the NAS focused as it, as it revised the project on revising the code on what, on the view that for a PI or public interest entity, it's, uh, it would, uh, if there is a service that might create a self-review threat that service uh, would represent a level of threats for which safeguards could not reduce the threat to an acceptable level. And as such, uh, it identified when do you have, when, when does a service, uh, or when is it a situation where the services result in something that might create a self-review set threat? And you'll notice in the first bullet point, it focuses on the results of the service will form part of the accounting records, internal control, over financial reporting or the financial statements on which an opinion would be expressed. And secondly, that it might be to rely on judgments made uh, or activities on, on any judgments made or activities performed by the firm or network firm. If we flip to the next slide, NAS also though spent some time addressing that there's a need to consider the manner in which a service is is provided in terms of identifying and evaluating the threats to independence. Um, it also provided some explanatory guidance on routine and mechanical bookkeeping and accounting services. Uh, it uh, just went through prohibition on services that might create a self-review threat for PI clients. And importantly to the technology project, uh, it put a prohibition on services involving designing or implementing IT systems for PI audit clients that form part of the internal control over financial reporting or generate information for the client's accounting records or financial statements. That last piece was an important stepping off point for the task force and the technology exposure draft uh, to build on. And if we could go to the next slide, um, here is section 6062A1. And this uh, effectively defines what IT system services are in a more broad, in a broad way compared to just that short phrase that had existed in the code. And it is designed to be all encompassing um, in, in terms of what's covered. And so you can see within the various bullet points, um, a lot of, uh, of t terminology um, besides designing and developing hardware or software, but it gets into what's implementing IT systems um, and the fact that that can involve a variety of things such as configuration or interface or customization or installing the operating, maintaining or monitoring, updating IT systems, uh, 
um, and, and then includes IT services related to collecting or storing data or managing directly or indirectly the hosting of data on behalf of the audit client. The, in, the indirectly was designed to encompass situations where um, the service might involve in today's uh, common practice that while you may be asked to be host something uh, as a service, many times you're actually hosting it on a cloud, which is some third party's cloud. And so the concept was just because if you, you've been engaged to host it, that's an IT system service. The fact that you use somebody else or a subcontract or contract to a third party to actually provide the hosting in the cloud uh, does not uh, get away from the fact that it is within the scope of IT system services. So 6062A1, think of it as the concept of a broad, uh, making it clear that the IT system services are all encompassing, um, building on what was this, the shorter phrase in NAS. Then if we can move to the next, um, Slide, please. Um, the, the board then looked at the services and, and how did they see them relative to threats and the ability to safeguard those threats. And the board had concluded that there were certain services, uh, IT system services that result in the assumption of management responsibility. And that included providing services in relation to the hosting directly or indirectly of an audit client's data. And then uh, operating an audit client's network security, business continuity or disaster recovery functions were uh, the two elements that the board felt met the uh, result in an assumption of management responsibility and that for which safeguards could not reduce the threat. An important exception to this is though, um, there are many cases in which um, uh, the, the, a client would provide to a professional accountant in practice the client's data or information in order for the professional accountant in practice to complete or perform a permitted service. And it, during that time period, the professional accountant in practice, um, in the course of providing that service, would obviously be holding on to or hosting that data. Uh, and may in fact in, ingest it into certain tools that allow for the facilitation of the execution of the project and allow for the client to access and understand that. Um, and the concept here was we were not, we did not consider that as a prohibition. That's what says those activities continue to be permitted. The concept was where you're the primary host of uh, and providing the services related to the primary hosting of the client's data, um, then you um, um, have to deal with the, uh, some, the management responsibility issue. And then for other activities, if you go to the next slide, 6064A3 addresses the fact that uh, many of them, uh, as it relates to public interest clients, um, would be viewed as as potentially, or that they might create a self-review threat. And for public interest entity clients, as you know, the board had previously concluded in the NAS project that if it might create a self-review threat, the service would not be permitted. And this, this slide outlines um, the, the issues related to the design, development, implementation, operations, maintenance, monitoring, or updating, and, and then a, and then a and then supporting, and supporting uh, clients' uh, IT systems, including network software and applications. Importantly, that last point about implementing accounting and financial information reporting software, um, whether or not it was developed by the firm or network firm, you will recall that in the prior versions of the code, um, there was a provision that suggested if you were implementing off the shelf software, um, that, and it had no significant customization that that did not necessarily create a self-review threat. However, as the board looked at that, given today's more advanced technological software package, it, um, you'll know that it usually entails a range of functionality and oper optionality uh, whereby decisions need to be made during the implementation process. And in general, for the board's view was uh, that off-the-shelf software might create a self-review threat. And thus, 
would also be prohibited for pies. An important point here though is for non-pies, the technology standard continues to allow for the consideration of the threat of, from uh, these services uh, and allows for the consideration of application of safeguards um, uh, that might reduce those to an acceptable level. So there is a very significant distinction here between how pies were thought about and how um, non-pies. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Greg, who's going to pick up on some of the other changes to the uh, international independence standards. Greg? All right, great. Thanks, Rich. And let's... Uh... There we are, there I am. Uh, yeah, so let's get into some of the other proposed revisions to the independent standards in the technology exposure draft and, and start with this one, uh, 600.9 A2. And, and the revision here is a new factor to the list of factors relevant in identifying threats created by a non-assurance service or NAS. If I slip into referring to NAS, I'm referring to non-assurance service. Um, from in that list of factors that's included in 600.9A2. And you see the marked change here on the slide, the additional factor, the client's dependency on the service, including the frequency with which the service will be provided. And, and the, the, the basis or the idea behind this addition is that um, uh, the, the, the provision of, of frequent or continuous monitoring or analysis services are becoming more prevalent in the digital age where it, it is uh, the facility of being able to provide a service that is um, more complete and more frequent because of the ease through the ease of execution through automation. These sorts of frequent or continuous monitoring services are becoming more pre prevalent. And as we consider that, um, we consider that if the client has a dependency on that service, um, it could be regarded as forming part of the audit client's internal controls over financial reporting, thereby creating the potential assumption of a management responsibility or the creation of a self-review threat, which now, as Rich outlined with the new standards, uh, uh, the new requirements from the non-assurance service standard uh, is, is critical to identify those self-review threats. So that is the thought behind adding this factor uh, to the list of factors relevant in identifying different threats. Um, when providing non-assurance services as captured in 600.9A2. Moving on to the next slide, the technology exposure draft also proposes revisions to the examples of close business relationships in section 520, essentially clarifying what types of technology related business relationships would be considered close business relationships. And you can see two edits here. Um, the first, just some, um, some editorial revisions here to a, a legacy item around uh, arrangements under which the firm or network firm sells, resells, distributes, or markets the client's products or services, or the client sells, resells, distributes, or markets the firm or network firm's products or services, but also a completely new business relationship around development of a technology solution. Um, the first being distribution marketing, this now being development um, of technology, of a technology solution. So the new close example, the new example of a close business relationship being arrangements under which the firm or a network firm develops jointly with the client products or solutions which one or both parties sell or license to third parties. And again, as as technology products um, become more in the fore for firms, we we find this situation is is occurring more and more often. So worthy of including as an example of a close business relationship in Section 520. Moving to the next slide, the next proposal provides explicit clarification that the NAS provisions in Section 600 are applicable when a firm provides, sells, resells, or licenses technology to a client, and that technology performs some kind of service for the client. And as we did some of the independent surveys, we asked this specific question. Whether, whether, uh, whether firms or respondents would consider Section 600 applicable in that case. And a large portion or proportion of the respondents indicated that no, they did not believe that Section 600 would be applicable. And as we looked at that from the task force's perspective, again, with the idea of technology being an artificial um, person or an artificial professional or a resource, uh, 
um, the provision of that technology solution to an audit client essentially is providing some kind of service. The technology is generally doing something for that client. And it is that technology that then is essentially replacing the human capital that pre-automation would have been providing that service. So the classic example that we like to talk about as we were discussing this in the task force is some kind of tax preparation software, where prior to automation, the preparation of those tax returns might have been done by a firm's human capital. Now they might be performed by a software solution that is provided by the firm to an audit client. And the idea there is the firm is still performing a service. It is just through the technology that is being provided to the client as opposed to human capital, in which case the provisions in Section 600 related to non-assured services should still apply to the provision selling, reselling, or licensing of technology and require that the firm consider the service that is being provided to the client through that technology. So two paragraphs covering that, the first in Section 520, in case users of the code look at that provision of technology as a business relationship first, 520.7A1 will point them back to Section 600 in that case, indicating that the requirements and application material, application material in Section 600 would apply. And then 600.6 is where the guidance actually is, uh, indicating that the requirements and application material in Section 600 apply in circumstances where a firm or network firm uses technology to provide the non-assurance service to a client, or the firm or network firm actually provides, sells, resells, or licenses the technology itself to an audit client. If we move to the next slide, uh, the technology ED also provides clarifications around what is considered routine and mechanical in the case of an automated service. And some feedback that we got was uh, maybe a default position that if a service is automated, it is uh, by definition routine and mechanical. And as we looked at the guidance on determining whether a service is routine and mechanical in the non-assurance services standard, um, the, the, the nature of how the service is delivered, be it automated or manually, is not a determinant factor in whether it's routine and me mechanical. Instead, what determines whether a service is routine and mechanical is the level of expertise or judgment applied by the firm, whether that is through human capital delivering the service or potentially if the service is automated through, through a technology tool that is executing the service. So you can see there to try and clarify in the technology ED, paragraph 601.5A2 um, is proposed, indicating that, in again, routine and mechanical being primarily in the accounting and bookkeeping services section, uh, those services can be manual or automated. But again, pointing out that in determining whether an automated service is routine and mechanical, the focus is on how that technology functions and whether the technology is based in expertise or judgments of the firm or a network firm. Similarly to that proposal, if we move to the next slide, the ED also proposes new application material uh, that acknowledges the use of technology like intelligent agents when delivering a service could result in the assumption of a management responsibility, just the same as if the service was delivered by the firm's human capital. So again, we wanted to make clear that just because a service might be delivered through technology, um, it did not mean that the firm was absolved, if you will, of having to consider whether or not the service provided through that technology could result in a manage the assumption of management responsibility. Because as technology continues to grow in intelligence, it is possible um, that the, uh, the, the technology being used, if it's artificial intelligence or based in machine learning, that there could be judgments being made uh, by that technology in delivering whatever services are being delivered um, that would be a management responsibility otherwise. So just a clarification that even when services are provided through technology, the firm still needs to consider whether uh, management responsibilities are being assumed through the execution of that technology. And then on the next slide, and lastly, uh, Rich mentioned revisions to part 4B, and there are a number of, uh, a number of the changes that we discussed um, up to this point in the international independent standards relate to part 4A. Uh, 
Um, they are carried back uh, in a conforming manner uh, and applied in part 4B as well. But the one we wanted to point out in this session um, is this reference in the very beginning of part 4B, section 900.1, a clarification that part 4b does apply and if you think of 900.1 there are examples of when that part 4b applies we wanted to add the clarification that part 4b applies to assurance engagements on an entity's non-financial information with the specific example of environmental social and governance disclosures including greenhouse gas statements essentially setting the marker for the application of part 4b to assurance engagements other than audits and reviews related to esg information and again there are other changes to part 4b in the technology ed that are largely changes that align with um, with the parallel changes that we've discussed in part 4a so with that, that concludes my prepared remarks. And at this point, I'll hand it back over to Cam and she'll uh, she'll uh, guide us through some of the questions that have been posed during the discussion. Thank you, Greg. Thank you, Rich, for um, a, a great presentation and walking through um, the key proposals. Um, we've received a number of questions uh, uh, live, so thank you very much. Um, but before diving into the questions, I'd just like to um, let everyone know that the slides and this recording of the webinar will be available on the ISBA website shortly after this um, webinar. Now, <clears throat> we have uh, a couple of questions in relation to hosting. Um, and in particular, I'm just going to read out the question received in the Q&A. And if you haven't already, feel free to submit your questions in the Q&A function. Uh, in your Zoom webinar panel. Um, so the question says, can the presenters please explain um, why the board determined um, that the hosting of clients data without regard to the extent or relevance of data to the client's financial statements is a prohibited management responsibility and how that differs from the prohibition in the part 4B assurance, engage, assurance engagements for the PA. Um, so I will ask Rich that if you would like to uh, provide an answer to that first. Thank you, Rich. Yeah, well, I uh, appreciate the question. For, as you note, uh, 4B um, prohibits the providing services or hosting services specific to the assurance uh, subject matter for which the then will be for the um, and in general, I think when we look at the section 600 of the code, uh, certainly welcome any comments from Greg, um, we focus on activities that would impact on the accounting records, the financial statements, or the internal controls over financial reporting. And in assessing whether a service particularly impacts on those internal controls over financial reporting, um, that one has to think about that they may be impacting information or data that is used by management in the execution of those controls. But I actually, um, I'm not sure I would have said that you couldn't host or provide hosting services for some kind of information if it had nothing to do with the accounting records, financial statements, or internal control over financial reporting. But I suspect that it could be quite challenging to identify uh, lots of situations where it wouldn't have an impact on one of those. So I'm, I'm not sure there was a uh, an absolute prohibition if it didn't have to do with those areas. Um, but I, I just as I think about the question, I, I wonder about whether there would be many situations where that be the case. And participants may have some and think of that, and that's fine. Um, so I, th I think, Cam, that's how I, I think about what was a, a good question raised there. Thanks, Rich. Um, Greg, did you want to add on to anything? On no, that? I just I just echo echo Rich's comments. Is that uh, you know when we considered 
the element or the example of assuming management responsibility, taking responsibility for designing, implementing, monitoring, or maintaining internal control. That was the aspect as it relates to host, hosting of, of, uh, of financial data or data that would relate to the financial statements that, that drove us to the conclusions in the proposal. Thanks for the, uh, and the, on the topic of hosting, I, I see a couple of clarifying questions in the uh, live Q&A. So um, question of, about uh, what is the difference between direct and indirect hosting? And if it's indirect, and if a third party is involved, if it's indirect and what it means by um, hosting, is it hosting of a primary, uh, if primary data of a audit client? So um, maybe Rich uh, in the first instance, you, could yeah, I, I, the audience. Yeah. certainly. Um, so I, I, I mean, I, I don't think you sh we should put too much emphasis on the difference between director and direct. As I said earlier, that was merely designed to say that just be if, if you are contracted to provide the hosting services, the fact that you use a third party like a cloud service provider to actually be the, the servers on which the data sits doesn't um, exist the provisions of the, the code prohibiting hosting services, right? It's no different than if you're providing a service and you're subcontracting part of it to somebody else. If the service is prohibited, the service is prohibited regardless of whether you subcontract it to somebody else. Um, and then um, um, I think <laughs> the primary data, it's a great question. That was our focus that, you know, where the client's data was resident on the professional accountants um, uh, uh, servers and the services that go around hosting really become are the management responsibilities. So I, I don't know that we were um, um, <clears throat> um, trying to deal, well, as I said, we were not trying to prohibit situations where the client, I'm gonna use a tax example, the client closes its books, it has its data, it provides the tax compliance service provider that data. The tax service provider puts typically today puts the, that data into tools they use. It, it manipulates that data or rearranges it in order to produce the line items required in various compliance returns. It produces those returns and produces copies of those returns to the client for filing. <clears throat> we That is not what we're talking about because that's that data was the client's data. They still have that data when they closed their books. Obviously had it to the, to the professional accountant in order to provide the prevented service. And that professional accountant might host that data for a period into the future uh, in order to assure consistency and, and uh, classification and things like that. So um, hopefully that helps the, the the uh, participate with their question. Thanks, Cam. Yeah, and Rich, maybe I'll add to, you know, as we as Rich kind of answers the questions here and talks about, you know, what the intentions of the task force were, I think it's important to remind everyone that these, these are still in proposal stage, and it would be really helpful. You know, we can explain what our intention was as the task force, but um, it would be really valuable if that intention is not clear or could be made more clear or emphasis um, as we go out and begin to, to craft the final standard, if you could put those sorts of points in your response letters to the exposure draft, because that will help be helpful to us in crafting whether adjustments should be made to the final standard or, or potentially in the preparation of non-authoritative material post issuance of a final standard. So the, these sorts of questions are really helpful in guiding the task force in the next stage of, of the development of the standard. Yeah, that's right. And the exposure draft is available on the uh, ISBA website. Um, just gonna drop the link into the uh, Q&A box so everyone can see shortly. Um, I'm conscious of time. We have one minute, but I, I do want to take one more question. Um, this was a question about uh, the client's dependency on the service in, in relation to paragraph 600.982. Um, and what that actually means is that in respect of financial reporting or financial controls or broader and tacking onto that um, is materiality a consideration in the designing, implementing, 
um, developing of IT systems control um, in respect of the self-review threat prohibition. Um, maybe I'll, I'll ask Greg to, to respond to that. Yes, thank you. Yeah, I think I think the the frequency again it is a factor to consider when identifying whether a threat is present, and certainly that that threat is more likely to be present when the service that is being provided is around internal controls related to financial reporting, because of the the element of creating a management responsibility or even self through self review to the extent that the internal controls over, over financial reporting are being audited. So yes, I mean, the, the, the greater connectivity of that service and the frequency of the service or the dependency on subject matter related to the financial statements, I think increases the likelihood of either the assumption of a management responsibility or, or a self-review threat. Um, and then as it relates to materiality, impacting the creation of a self-review threat, um, no, uh, there, there is no materiality threshold in the creation of a self-review threat. Um, if it is present, it is present. And if it is present and the service is being delivered to a PI, then the self-review threat prohibition would kick in regardless of any materiality considerations. If it is provided to a non-PI, then yes, it, the threat would be identified. However, in evaluating the service in a non-PI situation, the materiality may impact the evaluation of the severity of that threat and then there you know, and then pull through the actions needed to address the threat. But in a pie situation uh, or the identification of the threat, no materiality threshold needs to be identified. In the case of applying the pie prohibition, once you've identified the self-review threat, then the service would be prohibited for a pie. Thanks, Greg. Rich, did you have anything to add on to the response? No, no I think that covered it. Okay, great. Thank you all for staying a um, couple minutes over time and, and thank you Rich and Greg for a great presentation today. Um, as a reminder, we will be posting this uh, recording on our website and also um, please do respond to our exposure draft, which also available on the website, which I've just dropped into the Q&A chat. Hopefully everyone can see the link to that. Thank you everyone once again and uh, good morning, good afternoon and good evening. Thanks everyone. Thank you.